Greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob Walker here, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, spiritual darkness, but shall have the light of life. And that light is eternal life. This is going to be part of the Resurrections of the Bible. We've covered pretty much everything except for there's three more resurrections that I know of in the Bible. The uh, resurrection of Christ, covered that last video. But then there's going to be the two witnesses that confront the beast then there's going to be the resurrection of the just that happens at the end of the tribulation. And that's what this study is going to be about. And then there is the resurrection of the unjust at the end of the thousand year or the millennial reign of Christ. So... Let's take a look at, well, the two witnesses. Uh, I was thinking maybe we'll do two videos. Yeah, maybe this won't be the uh, resurrection at the end of the tribulation. Maybe we'll just do the two witnesses. We'll see how long it takes because I don't like to just give you information and without backing it up. Uh, I don't like it when people say, Oh, Bob, you're pulling verses out of context. Pretty hard to do when you read entire chapters, you know? So, with that in mind, turn your Bible, King James preferably, to the book of Revelation. And we are going to study about the two witnesses that are going to confront the beast, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist. He has several different names, so. But John calls him the beast. All right, let's start with Revelation chapter 12. I did an entire Bible study on Revelation chapter 12, but we're just going to kind of look at something real quick here. My point being is that some people will tell you that all the Bible prophecy is past. Uh, they call them preterists. Uh, sorry, some events are past. Some were in the present during the time of Paul and John. Some events are future. So, but there's people that will tell you that, well, all, the entire book of Revelation is future and when they tell you it's all future or all past they're all wrong part of it was in the past part of it is in the future part of it was going on so uh let's see all right let's go read revelation chapter 12 verse 1 and uh we're not going to read the whole chapter but if you're interested, I have an entire study on Revelation chapter 12, verse 1. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. Now, I did a study on this. This has reference to the dream that Joseph had before he went to Egypt. You know, one of Joseph, one of the 12 tribes. The sun was his father, the moon was his mother, and the crown of 12 stars, well, those were the 12 tribes of Israel. And I guess you could say this basically relates to Mary or Eve or maybe both 
or uh, Sarah or Rebecca. Uh, you know, depending on how you look at it. So, a woman clothed with the sun. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth and pained to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. And when you're talking about horns, you're talking about government generally. So, and his tail, the dragon, drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And I believe this is Christ. Why? Because verse 5. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. So obviously this is was uh, part of it was the past, but when he will rule all nations with a rod of iron, uh, that's going to be the future. So sometimes Revelation could be talking about the past, then the future, then the present, then the future, and then the past. It skips around. Verse 6. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared to God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days, which roughly corresponds to 42 months which is the time of the tribulation. And there was war in heaven, was, past tense, past tense, and there was, not there will be, no, and there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought, and his angels... See, sometimes when they talk about stars, they're talking about angels. See Job 38. And the dragon fought in his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out. Cast out of where? Heaven. That old serpent. Think about Genesis chapter 3, the serpent that was talking to Eve wasn't a snake. What is this old serpent? That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Huh. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation, and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ for the accuser of our brethren is cast down which accuseth them before our God day and night and they the church the bride and they overcame him the devil by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony and they loved not their lives unto the death but, 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 Bob, we're going to be flying away in the pre-trib rapture. We're not going to have to love our lives, not love our lives unto death. Well, that's their opinion. So, uh, so let's stop right there. All right, let's go to the book of Luke, chapter 10. You know, I always think, oh, yeah, I could probably do this study in 30, 40 minutes, and it ends up being an hour and something. Because I always try to give you background information. So, all right, Luke chapter 10, verse 1. After these things, the Lord appointed other 70 also, and sent them two and two before his face into every city and place, 
whither he himself would come. So he had 35 teams of two. Why two? Because the Bible records that in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall everything be established. So, uh, the 70. Hmm. Lord had 70 people that were proclaiming him to cities. Verse 2. Therefore said he unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he, that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. Go your ways, behold, I send you forth as wool, uh, as lambs among wolves. Carry neither purse nor script, script is a type of money, nor shoes, and salute no man by the way. And into whatsoever house ye enter, first say, Peace be to this house. And if the Son of Peace be there, your peace shall rest upon it. If not, it shall turn to you again. And in the same house remain, eating and drinking such things as they give. For the laborer is worthy of his hire. Go not from house to house. And into whatsoever city ye enter, and they receive you, uh, eat such things as they set before you. And heal the sick that are therein. And say unto them, The kingdom of God has come nigh unto you. Wish I had the power to heal sickness, but I've asked, but the Lord has been silent, so I guess that's a no. Verse 10. But into whatsoever city ye enter, and they receive you not, go your ways out into the streets of the same, and say, Even the very dust of your city, which cleaveth on us, we do wipe off against you. Notwithstanding, be ye sure of this, that the kingdom of God has come nigh unto you. But I say unto you, that it shall be more tolerable in that day for Sodom than for that city. See, the, uh, the angels that went to Sodom, they didn't uh, perform any miracles. That, well, they made the men of the city blind the ones that wanted to rape them. But here these guys are healing people and proclaiming the gospel of Christ. And the city is, they don't want to accept it. So it'll be more tolerable in the judgment day for Sodom than for these places, is how I see it. Verse 13. Woe unto thee, Chorazin, woe unto thee, Bethsaida, for if the mighty works had been done in Tyre and Sidon, which had been done in you, they had a great while ago repenting, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. Let me tell you something, people. When you repent in sackcloth and ashes, fasting and prayer, the Lord is going to listen. Trust me. But it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. If I remember correctly, Tyre was an island off the coast. I think it was near Lebanon. I forget exactly where, but it was, it was an island not too far off the coast. And it was a ship... Uh, a ship port where they used to go all over the Mediterranean and, and trading and supposedly pretty wealthy. Alexander the Great, they call him the Great because he was a great conqueror, if I remember correctly, went, to, went and sent an ambassador to Tyre and asked him to surrender. And in their well, I wouldn't say pride, but they didn't think he could uh, 
get across the water to conquer his city. So they basically blew him off. And so what did Alexander the Great do? Well, he took rocks from the countryside, started throwing them in the water until uh, he had an army now, a large army. You know, can you imagine uh, 10,000 men each gathering 10 stones each and throwing them in the water? So eventually they built a bridge, a causeway, I guess you could say, from the shore to the walls of the city. Well, <laughs> they got, uh, when they saw what was going on, they, they got kind of scared. They weren't so cocky, I guess you could say. But uh, from what I understand, Alexander destroyed Tyre. And that was actually prophesied in Scripture. So, But it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. Verse 15. And thou Capernaum, Luke 10, 15. And thou Capernaum, which art exalted to heaven, shalt be thrust down to hell. Verse 16. He that heareth you, heareth me. And he that despiseth, despiseth you, despiseth me. And he that despiseth me, despiseth him that sent me. And who sent Christ? God the Father. And I kind of look at this the same way at Paul. God the Father sent Jesus. Jesus sent Paul. And if you just say despise Paul, I think you're in big trouble. But hey, that's my opinion. Because there's a lot of people that will tell you the church has been wrong about Paul for almost 2,000 years. And they'll tell you the all the books that Paul wrote are wrong. They'll tell you the book of Acts is wrong because the book of Acts records the conversion of Paul and some of his journeys. And 2 Peter confirms Paul as a brother in the faith. Oh, that's wrong too, they'll tell you. But hey, if you want to listen to... Uh, oh, let's see. Let me look it up. Now, Paul wrote two books, one to Titus and another to Timothy. And they're, when you go to Bible college, they call these the pastoral epistles or letters for training pastors. But in the book of Titus, chapter 1 and verse 14, one of the reasons why they don't like Paul is because Paul gives you some very good advice in Titus 1.14. He says, not giving heed, in other words, don't pay attention to, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. What is a not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth? Oh, Oh, that, oh, now I know why they don't like Paul. Yeah, here we go, right here. Yeah, gee, I wonder why. All right, let's go back to Luke 10 and verse 17. And the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us, through thy name. Huh. You know why there's such a thing, a push for this Yeshua garbage? This is why. The devils are subject to the name of Jesus. The New Testament was written in Greek, not Hebrew. And that's another lie. They'll tell you, oh yeah, well the New Testament was originally Hebrew, but those, those anti-Semitic Greeks mistranslated the Bible and made it an anti-Semitic book. Really? 
Yeah, they actually teach this garbage. Of course, they won't come quite right out and say it that way. But uh, that is the intent. Now, if you ever have a trouble understanding the Bible, James chapter 1 tells you that if any of you lack wisdom, what is wisdom? Wisdom is not only knowing things, but knowing how to use that knowledge. Knowing that a stove gets hot is one thing. Knowing not to stick your hand on a hot stove, now that's wisdom. Yeah, believe it or not. So, but even the devils are subject unto us through thy name, and that name is Jesus. All right, Greek, verse 18. And he, Christ, and he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. So Satan being cast out of heaven is not a future event. It happened in the past. Keep that in mind. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing by any means and nothing shall by any means hurt you. And he's talking about your soul and spirit, not your physical life. Okay. Notwithstanding in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven you rejoice because your names are written in the book of life people that's the important thing all right let's take a look see revelation 12 part of it is future part of its past so all right, let's go take a look at something. All right, so why is there two witnesses? Well, in Deuteronomy 19.15, we read, One witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or for any sin. In any sin that he sinneth at the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witnesses shall the matter be established. So... Because it was a very serious thing. Uh, three witnesses could, or two or three witnesses could have somebody put to death. As recorded in Deuteronomy 17, 6. At the mouth of two witnesses or three witnesses shall he that is worthy of death be put to death. But at the mouth of one witness, he shall not be put to death. Now, uh, something you should know. If two or three people conspired against somebody to be bear false witness and they were caught lying about it, they were to be put to death if the penalty for what they were accusing of, of was a capital crime. And there were several capital crimes in the Bible. Adultery was one. Uh, witchcraft was another. So, you know, if they were accusing a man, if two or three people were accusing a man of adultery, and it was proven that they were lying, they were executed. So perjury was not something looked upon lightly. So, you know, people would... If people knew that they were going to get the same penalty as what they were lying about, if they were caught, uh, people would think twice about it. You know, during divorce cases, uh, women lie in divorce cases all the time. And they almost never suffer any, any kind of penalty for lying, even if it's proven true. So, I don't know. That's why they ought to make 
I, I honestly believe that there should be death penalty for adultery. Of course, I would have been put to death a long time ago. But uh, I don't know. It's a serious thing. It really is. God hates divorce. Hates abortion, too. That's another death penalty. Uh, somebody commits, uh, performs an abortion. That's, yeah, very serious. All right, so let's take a look. All right, let's go to Revelation chapter 11. This is where I'm going with this. Oh, my. I'm almost talking for half an hour, and I haven't even started yet. Sheesh. Oh, well. All right. Um, I just discovered something. Wow. You know what? Maybe I need to take a look at something. Hold on a minute. Now, I believe there there is going to be a temple built uh, that the man of sin, the Antichrist, the son of perdition, the beast, whatever you want to call him, he got he has several different names, uh, that they're going to build one and start doing animal sacrifices. There are people who say I'm wrong, uh, but the, I think I'm right. I really do. I try not to stray too far from the Bible. And uh, believe it or not, there is a temple. I think it's called San Paulo, Brazil. You can look it up. Uh, uh, temple in Brazil. Took them three and a half years. About 42 months, 1260 days or something like that. To build this temple. And supposedly it's a full-scale replica of the temple that uh, in Solomon's day. Now I found it funny that it took about three and a half years to build, which is uh, 42 months, 1200 and whatever it is, 1260 days or yeah. All right, so let's go to Thessal second. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. And this is about the coming of Christ. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. All right, we're talking about the coming of Christ, second coming, and our being gathered together. Verse 2 that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means. Isn't that what Matthew 24, what Jesus was saying? Take heed that no man deceive you. And, you know, if you read the Bible, like I have, it's going to be pretty hard for them to deceive you. It really is. I mean, because you'll know. God lays out the future. And Satan is going to do exactly what God says. He, they're, they're going to have the temple. They're going to have the man of sin come. The Antichrist, the beast, son of perdition, whatever you want to call him. It's going to be laid out just like the Bible says. But it does require our time. You want to sit around and watch television? And, you know, no problem. Go do it. Go, go watch television. But, as for me, I like to study the Word. And you know what? I learn a lot by teaching. Really, I do. Somebody once told me, he says, if you really want to learn a subject, teach it. Because the students are going to ask you questions that you're not going to know the answer to and that you're going to have to dig to find out. And after you've taught a subject for 
a period of time, you're going to know it pretty well. And yeah. All right, so 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day, what day? The second coming. For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. Falling away from what? The faith. The faith in Christ. Except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. The man of sin. Son of perdition. Do you know who else was called the son of perdition? Judas Iscariot. Jesus said, Have I not chosen ye twelve, and one of you is a devil? That's the word evil with a capital D in front of it. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. So that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So unless this happened in the past, and it didn't, I don't care what any preterist says. Those liars will tell you, oh, well, the Roman general, he, he went into the temple of God and, and proclaimed himself that he was God. General Titus. Let me tell you something. Do you honestly think the emperor of Rome is going to worship one of his generals under him that proclaims himself that he's God? I don't think so. You think uh, some general in the army is going to tell the president of the United States that he's God and he has to worship him? I don't think so. And neither should you. So if it didn't happen in the past... It has to happen in the future. And this is what preterists do. They lie. They'll tell you the whole book of Revelation is past. Well, some of them. You got partial preterists. There's a lot of truth to what a partial preterist teaches. I got to admit. Because Matthew 24 was partially fulfilled in 70 AD. But there are things that are yet to come. A lot of times in God's plan, there's a partial fulfillment, and then there's an ultimate final fulfillment. So, the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Hmm. Verse 5. You see, this is another reason they don't like Paul. Paul warns you about the future, what's going to happen. He tells you the plan. Oh, Paul's a false apostle. Don't read this. Oh, no, don't read this. Verse 5. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? And now you know that you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Uh, who is letting or preventing things from happening? Personally, I think it's Michael the angel. No, Michael's not an angle. He's an angel. He fought with the dragon, and he prevailed against the dragon. Some people will tell you, oh no, it's the Holy Spirit that's uh, withdrawn and allows Satan to do his dirty work on the earth. I don't think so, because during the tribulation, people get saved. And if the Holy Spirit is removed, the Holy Spirit convicts people of sin. And if the Holy Spirit is removed, 
people are not going to be convicted. That's what I think a conscience is, at least in some people, if not all. The Holy Spirit convicts people of sin. And if that doesn't happen, they don't get saved. The Holy Spirit has a part in our conversion. But the Bible says that if any of you lack understanding or lack wisdom and understanding, let him ask of God. Ask the Lord in prayer for wisdom and knowledge and understanding, and I bet you he'll give it to you. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. I think there'll be a time when God tells Michael, step aside, let the evil do its run its course. Verse 8. And then shall that wicked be revealed. Who? The son of perdition, the, the, bee, um, the man of sin. Whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his coming and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. So the prince of darkness will be destroyed by the prince of light, I guess you could say. Verse 9, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, the beast people, the Antichrist, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Miracles, people. Miracles. This, this Antichrist the man of sin, the son of perdition, is going to come working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Read Job chapter 1. Satan did all kinds of satanic miracles on Job, including having power over the weather, being, say, being able to send a whirlwind of wind to destroy one of the houses. Was it a tornado? That's my guess. I mean, yeah. God allows Satan to have a certain amount of power. Read Job, the book of Job. I mean, God didn't strike Job with boils and all these things. Satan did. Of course, God allowed it. So, all right, let's see. All right, verse 10. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. They didn't want Jesus Christ. They wanted the man of sin. Verse 11. And for this cause, God, not Satan, God, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Do you know what it means to be deluded? It means you believe something that's not true. If you thought I was a young guy, you'd be deluded. But who's going to send this delusion to them? God. God is going to deceive them that they should believe a lie. Why? Why? Verse 12. That they all might be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. They didn't want the things of God. They wanted pleasure and rejoicing in evil things. So this man of sin, there's going to be false miracles running around. So let's take a look at some of that. You know, I didn't intend for this to be an end time study, but that's what we're doing. Uh, it just kind of works out that way. All right, Revelation chapter 13. 
Verse 1. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, the sea of humanity, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon, the devil, and the dragon gave him his power, and his seat, and great authority. So this beast is going to be given his power by Satan himself. Verse 3, And I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered, after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon. Now remember, the dragon is just a figure of speech for Satan the devil. The devil and Satan. We read that in Revelation chapter 12, right? And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying... Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And I'll tell you what, in the flesh, nobody is going to be able, on this earth, no flesh human is going to be able to fight Satan. Um, uh-uh, no way. Not in our own power, anyways. And there was given unto him the beast, a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. Now, let me tell you something, people. In Matthew 24, I guess we ought to read it. Yeah, let's make this an end time study. I was hoping that we'd be this would be a short one, but it's going to be a long one. You know, this is a very important study. Uh, everybody's saying, "Oh yeah, Mister, uh, you know who got, that is the presidential selection." Uh, they're saying he's the antichrist. I don't think so. I think he's the forerunner. Uh, Sort of like their, their fake John the Baptist. Proclaiming the way for the beast. But, hey, that's, you know, my opinion. But, you know, what can I tell you? Matthew 24, verse 1. Uh, Mark 13 is a parallel uh, um, account of this. But I like Matthew 24. Verse 1, And Jesus went out and departed from the, from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. The temple. Jesus said all the stones are going to be thrown down. So, when a certain group of people tell you the Wailing Wall is part of the temple, you got a choice. You can believe them, or you can believe Jesus. Uh, what did we read about Jewish fables? Oh, yeah. Verse 3. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, now when Jesus returns, to my knowledge, He's going to plant his feet on the Mount of Olives. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming, and of the end of the world? This present world, right? Verse 4. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. 
Haven't we heard that before? Pay attention. Don't let anybody trick you or deceive you. Verse 5. For many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines. The Lord tells you what's going to happen in the end times. There's going to be famines. Maybe you should prepare. And pestilences. And earthquakes. In divers places. Many places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they... Yeah, better watch out for them. Better, and then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. Who? Christians. And ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. What is that name? Jesus. They're not going to kill you for using Yeshua. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended. What? What do you mean I'm going to be uh, uh, afflicted and get killed for the name of Jesus? I didn't sign up for this, people. Oh, that's offensive. They're going to end up denying Christ. Trust me. Jesus said, if you deny him before men, he would deny you before the Father and his angels. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. Yeah, those people that were in the church building, so-called, with you, proclaiming, oh, Jesus loves you. Amen. Praise God. Love you, Jesus. When they find out they're going to have to die for their faith, they're going to be offended. They're going to turn you in so that they can escape death. And they're going to hate you. Why? Because they were never the Lord's sheep. They were goats that thought they were sheep. But, well, maybe some of them were sheep, but... Verse 11. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. Huh. Didn't that what we read? And because iniquity, wickedness, sin, evil, and because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end the same shall be saved. Verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. Same word as Gentiles. And then shall the end come. Listen to this carefully. Then ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation. Spoken of Daniel spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. What is the abomination of desolation? If you ask me, it's going to be, well, I think performing animal sacrifices as a denial of what Jesus did on the cross and shedding of his blood is, uh, that's an abomination. But when you see the beast, the Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition, standing in the temple, proclaiming himself that he is God, demanding worship. I think that's the abomination of desolation. So what does the Lord say to do when you see this? As soon as you see this happen, what does the Lord tell you to do? Verse 16. Then let him which be in Judea 
flee into the mountains. Whoa. When the two witnesses appear to confront the beast, or when the you see the man of sin in the temple proclaiming himself as God, what does the Bible say to do? Well, if you're in Judea, flee into the mountains. But suppose you're in the United States. Well, flee to the mountains. I'm going to have a problem doing that because I live in Florida, but uh, I think the nearest mountains are like a thousand miles away. But verse 17, let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, no nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, miracles, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. See, people that don't know their Bible, that just go to a so-called building called a church and listen to wolf pastors and watch those TV preachers begging for money all the time, they're going to be deceived? Possibly. Very possibly. I think it's very likely. Especially when the TV preachers say, Even Christ has returned. The Messiah. The Messiah has come. Verse 26. Jesus. The, all these words are Christ speaking. Wherefore, if they, sh if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. It's going to be the whole sky is going to light up like it's being lit up by lightning when Christ comes. There's not going to be any mistaking when he comes. Verse 28. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. Immediately after, immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Verse 31. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. God loves to blow the those has those. God loves to have those trumpets blown. There's seven trumps trumpets, not Donald, in the book of Revelation. All right, so let's go back to uh, Revelation eleven.
Oh, uh, no, I'm sorry. Revelation 13. Let's go to verse 4. And they worshiped the dragon which gave power unto the beast, and they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given to, unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. You know what? If your name's not in the book of life, you're going to worship the devil. Verse 9. Revelation 13, 9. If any man have an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. Some of us, if, we're, if it is our lord's will that we are to go into captivity to be put to death for his testimony we're to go if they're going to try to kill you for your faith in christ you're to go willingly he says he that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword here is the patience and the faith of the saints if they say Hey, Christian, come out. We're going to cut your head off. You're not to fight them. You're supposed to go into captivity. Because if you kill them the same way you killed them, they're going to kill you. At least that's how I see this. Verse 11. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb. He's mimicking the Lamb of God, Christ, and he spake as a dragon. So he's trying to pass himself off as the Lamb of God, but he's really a dragon. The devil. Verse 12. Listen to this carefully. And he exerciseth all the power, all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, miracles, so that he maketh fire come down from the heaven, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. This is exactly what Elijah the prophet did to the soldiers of Baal, uh, Ahab. There were 50 soldiers and a captain. And they were going to take Elijah. And Elijah said, If I be a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and devour you and your 50. And fire came down from the sky and burned up those 50. You want to read about that? All right, in the book of 2 Kings, chapter 1, verse 1, Then Moab rebelled against Israel after the death of Ahab. Now, Ahab was a horrible king. I mean, one of, one of the worst. He was king of Israel. But you got to realize... Judah had a, a different king. And yeah, I know, they'll tell you, oh, Judah is Israel, and Israel's Jews, and no, they're... Uh, let me tell you something. Judah, southern Judah, had a capital in Jerusalem, and they had a different king. Israel, when they split from 
Judah. Their capital was Samaria. They were north of Jerusalem. They had a different king. Sometimes the kings of Israel and Judah fought wars against each other. So when you hear a preacher say, oh, they're all the same, they're lying. There is no way in hell that some preacher can go to Bible college for four years and not know this. Impossible. You have to read the entire Bible from cover to cover. You'd have to know this. You'd have to read the book of Kings. I mean, you would know that Jehoshaphat was king of Judah and Ahab was king of Israel. And then to say that they're the same, they're lying. So, which is why I'm kind of a lone ranger here. All right, verse 1. Then Moab rebelled against Israel after the death of Ahab. And Ahaziah fell down through a lattice in his upper chamber that was in Samaria and was sick. And he sent messengers and said unto them, Go inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, whether I shall recover of this disease. Beelzebub, B-A-A-L, is just a generic word for God or Lord. Uh, but it became so associated with Satanism that God didn't want them using that to reference him anymore. The God of Ekron, not the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So, so go to uh, go to one of the devil gods and ask him if I'm going to get better. Verse three. But the angel of the Lord said unto Elijah the Tishbite, the, who Elijah was one of God's prophets. He says, Arise. Go up to meet the messengers of the king of Samaria and say unto them, is it, not, is it not because there is not a God in Israel that ye go to inquire of Beelzebub, the God of Ekron? Good question. Now therefore, thus saith the Lord, thou shalt not come down from that bed on which thou art gone up, but shalt surely die. And Elijah departed. And when the messengers turned back unto him, he said unto them, Why are ye now turned back? I guess that's their way of saying, uh, How come you guys came back so quick? And they said unto him, the messengers to the king, There came a man up to meet us and said unto us, Go, turn again unto the king that sent you, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Is it not because there is not a God in Israel that thou sendest to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron? Therefore thou shalt not come down from that bed on which thou art gone up, but shalt surely die. And he said unto them, What manner of man was he which came up to meet you and told you these words? And they said, He was an hairy man, and girt with a leather, with a girdle of leather about his loins. And he said, It is Elijah the Tishbite. Now, if you're interested, I have an hour and 40 minute study on Elijah. And Elijah is going to be one of the two witnesses. That is what the Bible declares. Then the king sent unto him a captain of 50 with his 50. So here it is. You've got a, a captain of 50 soldiers. 50 and a captain is 51. And he went up to him and behold, he sat on the top of an hill and he spake unto him, Thou man of God, the king hath said, come down. Hmm. All right. Hey, uh, you man of God, the king said, come on down. 
verse 10. And Elijah answered and said to the captain of 50, If I be a man of God, then let fire, then let fire come down from heaven. Fire come down from heaven and consume thee in thy 50. And there came down fire from heaven and consumed him in his 50. Can you imagine all the people that were watching these 50 soldiers going to get Elijah the prophet? And all of a sudden fire comes down from the sky like a flamethrower and just burns up all 50 and the captain, the 51? Wow. Well, guess what? One of the false uh, prophets is going to have the same power. Yeah. Let's go back to Revelation 13. Well, let's start in verse 11. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he, the false prophet, doeth great wonders. Well, oh, I'm sorry, the beast. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Wow. He's going to mimic the miracles of Elijah in the Old Testament. Huh. What do you want to bet that this one... Uh, let's see. Well, don't be surprised if the false prophet calls himself Elijah. So don't be surprised if there's two Elijahs running around doing miracles. So he's going to make fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Verse 14. And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth. He's going to deceive those people. By the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. Oh, okay. So this is the false prophet. Because he has the power in the sight of the beast. Saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast. Which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. You know, every time I read that, I always thought of television, but I don't know. You know, I, I'm not saying it is television. I'm not saying that. But when I read this, I think about TV. But verse 16, And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads and that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Hmm. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast for it is the number of a man and I think man was created on the sixth day. That's why six is the number of a man. For it is the number of a man, and his number is 600, three score and six. 666, 666. And if you look up the word mark, it has reference to a... Uh, in, if you look it up in the Greek... It has reference to a prick, an etching in the skin. Now, in the King James Bible, it says, receive a mark in, in, I-N, in their right hand or in their foreheads. All the modern Bibles change that and say on. There's a big difference. 
if you take rattlesnake or a cobra or a, let's say a black mamba and you take their venom and put it on your skin yeah you might suffer some health problems a little bit but if you put that in your skin you're in big trouble there's a big difference between on and in think about it you take poison and lay it on your stomach no big deal you take that poison in through your mouth in your stomach you're in trouble big trouble and I think they're getting ready for the mark but hey what can I tell you all right let's go to uh, da -da 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 -da. all right let's go back to Revelation chapter 11 and hopefully we can close this out all right let's go to Revelation chapter 11 Verse 1, And there was given me a reed, like unto a rod, and the angels stood, saying, Rise, and measure the temple of God, and the altar, and them that stop uh, worship therein. But the court, which is without the temple, leave out, and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, or nations, same word, and the holy city, what city is that? Jerusalem and the holy city shall they tread underfoot 40 and two months now people my guess is the time of sorrows is going to be approximately three and a half years uh, when you read about the time of sorrows in Matthew 24 which we just recently read however when the man of sin appears in the temple proclaiming that he is God and the two witnesses appear and what have you, that is going to be the time of Jacob's trouble. Jacob's name was Israel. And of course, preachers will tell you, oh, well, that's not us. Well, I beg to differ. But, uh, 42 months is going to be a time of sorrows. It's going to be bad. But this 40, this last 42 months is going to be hell on earth for God's people. And that's where they get the uh, seven-year tribulation period. But the way I see it, it's broken up into two three-and-a-half-year, 42-month time periods. So... But the court which is without the temple leave out measure it not for it is given unto the gentiles nations and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months and i the lord and i will give power unto my two witnesses and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth that is roughly three and a half years or 42 months who are these two witnesses let's take a look all right did you know there are two people in the bible who never died yeah two people that never died and i'm not talking about christ uh, i'm talking about flesh and blood humans Let's take a look at 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 1, about the prophet Elijah. You know, the guy that brought fire from the sky down? Yeah. And it came to pass when the Lord would take up, take up, Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind, that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. And Elijah said unto Elisha, Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Bethel, uh, by the way, Beth means house. El has reference to God. So basically means house of God. And Elisha said unto him, As the Lord liveth, and as my soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went down to Bethel. And the sons of the prophets 
that were at Bethel came forth to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? Hey, uh, don't you know that the, uh, the Lord's going to take the prophet Elijah away today? And he said, Yea, I know it. Hold your peace. Basically saying, Yeah, yeah, I know it. Be quiet. Verse 4. And Elijah said unto him, Elisha, tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Jericho. And he said, As the Lord liveth, and as my soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they came to Jericho. And the sons of the prophets that were at Jericho came to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he answered, Yea, I know it. Hold, you, hold ye your peace. And Elijah said unto him, Terry, I pray thee here, for the Lord hath sent me to Jordan. And he said, As the Lord liveth, and as my soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And they too went on. And fifty men of the sons of the prophets went and stood to view afar off, and they too stood by Jordan. And Elijah took his mantle and wrapped it together and smote the waters. And they were divided hither and thither, so that they too went over on hot, dry ground. Elijah did the same thing that Moses did with the Red Sea when Israel uh, parted the Red Sea so that they walked on dry ground, and there was a wall of water on each side. And you know what? There are people who tell you, oh no, that wasn't the Red Sea. What it really was, was the Sea of Reeds. Now, reeds grow in shallow water. Uh, reeds cannot grow in, if they're completely covered in water, they can't grow. So basically it has to be, you know, maybe knee deep, maybe hip deep, that's it. And they'll say, well, it really wasn't a miracle. You know, they just, uh, uh, Israel crossed the Sea of Reeds, you know, maybe knee high water. So it really wasn't a miracle. But you know what the miracle is? Is that Mos uh, uh, Pharaoh's army drowned in knee deep water. That's, that is the real miracle if they want to play that game. So, yeah. So, they crossed over the Jordan River on dry ground. Verse 9. And it came to pass, when they were gone over, that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. You know what you got? I want double. I want double the Holy Spirit power that you got. Boy, that's pretty brazen, huh? And he said, Thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. All right. So if you see me when I leave, your wish is granted. But if you don't see me, well, the answer is no. Verse 11. And it came to pass, as they went on and talked, that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire, a chariot of fire and horses of fire, and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. There was a chariot of fire, horses of fire from heaven, took Elijah and separated them both. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Elijah never died, people. Elijah never died. Verse 12. And Elisha saw it, and he cried, 
My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and rent them in two pieces. So Elijah never died. He went up to heaven. But he is going to be one of the two witnesses. How do I know that? Let's go to the book of Malachi, chapter 4, verse 1. It's a short. Uh, Malachi is considered one of the minor prophets. Uh, they call them minor prophets because of the size, not the importance of the book. Verse 1. Malachi, chapter 4, verse 1. Uh, these are the books just before the book of Matthew in the New Testament. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. So this is talking about when the Lord burns up the earth, people. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. But unto you that fear my name, shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves, calves by the stall. And ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. Whoa. And ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. Wow. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Here's the punchline. Verse 5. Listen carefully. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet. I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great day. I mean, I'm sorry, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Well, it's going to be dreadful for the wicked. Let's read that again. Behold, I, the Lord, will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great day and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Is there anybody else that was never died in the Bible? Yes, there is. All right, Genesis chapter 5. Now, remember, do not confuse Cain's Enoch with... Uh, the Enoch of the son of Adam, as opposed to the son of Cain. Or, I'm sorry, Enoch of Seth, as opposed to Enoch of Cain. There are two different Enochs. I'm talking about the one from Seth, the son of Adam. Genesis chapter 5, verse 21. And Enoch lived sixty and five years and begat Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah three hundred years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were three hundred sixty and five years. Huh. It's funny, we got three hundred and sixty five days in a year and he lived three hundred and sixty five years. 24. Listen to this carefully. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Huh? And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Enoch never died. God took him. Took him where? To heaven. Along with Elijah. They went up. I don't, well... Yeah, there's only two people. Never died. Now, there are other people. I think the two witnesses are going to be Elijah and Enoch. 
Other people have another idea. They believe it's going to be Moses. Why Moses? Oh, okay, I'm glad you asked that question. Now, I covered this a little bit yesterday, but let's take a look at it again. In Matthew 17, verse 1, And after six days Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John his brother, and bringeth them up into an high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. Transfigured. He was shining bright, like he was an angel. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with him. Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Moses was the law. He was dead. And Elias, which is the Greek rendering of Elijah, talking with Christ. And this is why people think uh, it's going to be Elijah and Moses. But Moses died. You want proof of that? Deuteronomy 34, 7. And Moses was 120 years old when he died. When he died... His eye was not dim, nor his natural force abated. Hmm. So, Moses died. Elijah didn't. Enoch didn't. All right. Uh, let's see. Let's go back to Revelation. 11. Let's try to close this out. My, this is going to, you know, I thought this was going to be a 30, 40 minute study. Boy, I was wrong. Revelation 11. All right, we're going to read this chapter and then we're going to close this Bible study out. Verse 1. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise, and measure the temple of God, and the altar, and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple, leave out, measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles in the holy city, shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. And I, the Lord, and I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days, clothed in sackcloth these are the two olive trees what did olives do olives uh, were where they got olive oil which is what they used to anoint the king and prophets with kings and olive oil you could take it and put it in a uh, put a wick in it and light it like you would a candle, an oil lamp. You could burn olive oil, believe it or not. But it was also symbolic of the Holy Spirit. So, you know, it gives light, olive oil. Um, these are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks. What do you do with a candlestick? You light it and it lightens up a room. You're not in darkness anymore, right? These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. No, their mouths are not going to be like a flamethrower. But remember, Elijah called, he said, If I be a man of God, let fire come and devour you and your 50 to the captain, right? And fire came down from the sky and burned up the 50 soldiers and the captain. That's what it means. The fire is going to proceed out of their mouth. And I'm sure the Jehovah's Witnesses will have a flamethrower sticking out of the guy's mouth and their stupid little pamphlets with their stupid little illustrations. No, that's not what it means. So, But, 
the uh, false prophet is going to have the same type of power. Verse 6. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them to blood, and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. Elijah had it so it didn't rain in Israel for three, I think it was three years. Let me tell you something, people. If it don't rain for three years, there's going to be a lot of dead things. You think your crops are going to grow without rain? I don't think so. Who had power to turn the waters to blood? Well, God did, and he used Moses, right? He uh, turned the water to blood during the uh, plagues of uh, Egypt. Oh, absolutely. During the book of Exodus? See, this is very similar to what happened in Exodus. And he's going to smite the earth with plagues as often as they will. What kind of plagues? Probably like, um, like Exodus, the plagues of Egypt. They're going to be able to do it as often as they want. Verse 7. And when they, the two witnesses... And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. Whoa. All right, so the two witnesses are going to be killed. Verse 8. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom. Now remember, what did God do to Sodom? He rained fire and brimstone upon it because it was so evil. Which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt. The Bible doesn't say anything nice about Egypt that I have ever seen in the Bible. If anybody can show me one thing where the Lord said anything good about Egypt, let me know, because I can't find it. Uh, and remember, Egypt had multiple gods. All the plagues of Egypt were uh, against the gods of Egypt. They had the Nile, the god of the Nile that they turned to blood and the Lord of the Flies, Beelzebub, uh, the lice, the cattle dying, uh, the, the days of darkness, which was against their sun god named Ra. Uh, you know, it was it, basically God was challenging the gods of Egypt, showing the Egyptians that he had power over and above every god of Egypt. I mean, it's what a challenge. And still they wouldn't honor the Lord God of heaven, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Verse 8, the two witnesses, and their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified funny people will tell you oh mystery babylon the great city oh it's uh new york or it's washington dc or it's rome or any other place they can think of was your lord crucified in rome of course they'll say well well he was crucified by rome so that fits uh i don't think so now, if you want to know where Christ was crucified, John chapter 19, we're not going to read the whole chapter, but we'll read 20, verse 20. This title then read many of the Jews, for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city. What city? Not Rome, Jerusalem. And it was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. Yeah. So, you know, uh, and if you don't know who killed, was responsible for killing Jesus, let me read. 
How about 1 Thessalonians chapter 15? Oh, wait a minute. This is Paul. Are you starting to understand why they hate Paul and want to want you to rip out all of Paul out of your Bible? Hmm. 1 Thessalonians 15 and verse 14. For ye brethren became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews. Even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and have persecuted us, and they please not God, and are contrary to all men. Forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles, or nations, that they might be saved, to fill up their sins alway, for the wrath is come upon them to the uttermost. I didn't see Pilate's name in there, or Rome. Did you? Yeah, me neither. Even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and have persecuted us, and they please not God, and they please not God, and they please not God, and are contrary to all men. Huh. Wow. All right. Uh, let's see. All right. Let's go back to Revelation 11. Verse uh, Revelation oh, 13. I'm sorry. 13 and verse 8. The two witnesses. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer or allow and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another. Hey, it's Christmas time. Because these two prophets tormented them that dwell on the earth. Ooh, here's, this is verse 11. Listen carefully. This is the important part. This is the whole purpose of this entire lesson. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life, the spirit of life from God, entered into them. Who? The two witnesses. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. These two witnesses are going to be resurrected from the death, from, the, from, dead, from being dead, and they're going to stand upon their feet, and all the people that see them are going to be scared. Boy, they're going to be scared. Verse 12. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. In other words, their enemies are going to watch this. And the same hour was there a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell, and in the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand, and the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to the God of heaven. There's going to be a remnant that are going to give glory to the God of heaven. And the second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. Whoa. Verse 15. And the seventh angel sounded. Remember, there's seven trumps. The seventh one is the last one. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Whoa, there. 
Wow. You see, when the seventh trumpet blows, Christ comes back and takes control. All right, let's read verse 16. So the whole purpose of this study was to show you it was about the, the this, this uh, series is on resurrections in the Bible. This is on the resurrection of the two witnesses. I just laid the groundwork. So let's finish up this chapter and then we'll close this out. Verse 16. And the four and twenty elders, who are they? Um, I believe the four and twenty elders are twelve and twelve. The uh, patriarchs of the twelve tribes, you know, Judah, Levi, Simeon, Naphtali, Joseph, you know, the twelve tribes. But who are the other twelve? Um, I think the twelve apostles. Minus Judas Iscariot plus Paul. That's who I think the 20 and 4 elders are. I got a Bible study on that. And the 4 and 20 elders which sat before God on their seats fell upon their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and to them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament, and there was lightnings, and voices, and thunderings, and an earthquake, and great hail. And people, we're going to, next cha uh, next Bible study, we're going to do the, uh, the resurrection of the saints. That will be the next study. God willing. And then the study after that will be the resurrection of the unjust. You want to be in the first resurrection after this one. Trust me, you do. You really, really, really do. You don't want to be in the second resurrection after this one. So, all right. Well, this is Chaplain Bob Walker. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' precious name. Amen.